Time is important to each of us. It affects our lives in many different ways. Today, Ralph Ames, horse trainer by profession, finds time working against him. As soon as Ralph can get away from the track, he and his family are leaving on their first vacation in two years. about an hour. Can I get out ahead of it? Yes, you should be well ahead of it. What's your aircraft number? N6436, Quebec. Thank you. down, Billy. We'll be ready to go just as soon as your mother's ready. Well, Ralph, the house is all locked up, and I even remembered to stop the newspaper. Genius, Mrs. Ames. That's what you are, nothing less. So, without further ado, let's, um... Oh. Well, isn't that nice? Come on, Billy, let's get the spare tire. We haven't got much time before the weather closes in. Ralph. Ralph, darling. I just remembered something. What? The spare tire. What about it? Well, that's it. What do you mean, that's it? How could the spare... Where the devil is it? Well, I, uh... I had a flat tire yesterday. Well, I took it to Charlie's gas station, intending to pick it up first thing this morning. But I guess I forgot. I guess you did. Well, it's a cinch we can't fit all this stuff in my car. Billy, go call the garage and tell them to make it quick. Well, oh, that's a good hour down the drain.
Hi, Mr. Ames. I'm Bill Weitzel, the owner of this spread. Please don't get up. May I join you? Please do, Mr. Weitzel. Nice to meet you. I understand you plan to be with us a few days. Yeah, that's right. Mrs. Ames tells me you plan to spend a good bit of your stay playing golf. I guess so. It's funny. I've been looking forward to getting in a good round just as soon as I got here, but, uh, well, I guess I'm just not in the mood. Oh, really? An avid golfer not in the mood because of your landing? Uh, you saw. Yes, I saw. Listen, those things can happen. <laughs> not too often, I hope. More often than you think. The number of mistakes I've seen private pilots make over the years is astonishing. Mistakes that often cause accidents. Yeah, when it's no fault of the plane. That's right. About 80% of the time, it's no fault of the plane. The fault is generally not with a pilot's skill. It's more often psychological. It's really his emotional state that really does him in. You're beginning to sound more like a psychologist than a man in the aviation business. Maybe so, but that's because practical psychology figures in. Pilot errors like the one you made generally spring from something I call an, an itis. About that uh, itis you were mentioning, do I uh, fit into that? You sure do. That itis that nearly racked you up on my runway out there, I call get there itis. It's a disease of general aviation pilots. They feel they must get there. Frequently, they kill themselves trying. Get there, itis. Oh. I guess I had it. Don't let it get you, Mr. Ames. You won't make the same mistake again. Take the professional or successful businessman, for instance. They frequently suffer from what I call give order itis. They're used to giving orders, not taking them. Fred Jorgensen there, he's a good example. I'm in the construction business. One afternoon, I had planned to cross country to check out some property I wanted to buy. But before I could leave, I had to straighten out a few problems. When I finally got away, I phoned ahead to the airport and told them to have my plane ready when I got there. The young fellow at the flight service station pointed out the location of some weak funnel activity that could cause me trouble, or so the kid said. He was polite, of course, and could only offer a suggestion. But his suggestion was clear, stay on the ground. What did he know? I've been flying for 30 years. Guess he thought I was too old or something. Well, I didn't take his advice. The weather looked all right to me, so off I went. they've got nowadays. The darn fool was landing the wrong way. I made a mental note to find out who the guy was and tell him what I thought of his flying. I kept wondering what could have gone wrong, and then suddenly, in my mind's eye, I saw it all. My approach to the active runway. I had made the wrong turn and taken off downwind. After realizing my mistake, things seemed to settle down. I decided to check the weather at my destination. The weather was down and the entire area was closing in fast. Yet there I was, flying right into the teeth of it and for no real reason. I kept thinking about what the kid at the flight service station tried to tell me. That close call ended my career as a bold pilot. You see, Mr. Ames, 
There are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old bold pilots. Very well put, Mr. Weitzel. Call me Bill, please. Fine, I'm Ralph. About your golf, Ralph, uh, I'm going to meet Wally Gray this afternoon. Would you like to join me? Is that the Wally Gray, the golfer? Yes, he's the one. Why don't you meet me at the clubhouse at 2 o'clock? Sounds great to me. Fine. See you then. Too bad Bill couldn't make it today. Sure is. He's a great guy. like playing this morning, but sure glad I did. How's that? Oh, I goofed this morning. I almost landed with my gear up. I don't know why, but I can't seem to get it out of my mind. I know exactly how you feel. I had a close call once. I'd been involved in several big tournaments and hadn't flown for several months. One afternoon, after shooting a few landings, I decided to try some slow flight. So far, so good. Then I started a power-on stall. The stall broke, stronger than I expected, and I found myself in a steep power-on spiral. I pulled the power off and started my recovery. All the right moves, or so I thought, as the plane leveled out and my airspeed dropped. I eased in on the throttle, but nothing happened. I gave it full throttle and still nothing happened. Man, those trees were coming up mighty fast. Finally, my power started to return. I was really shook. I headed back to the airport. I didn't have a clue as to what had gone wrong. Still shaken by my close call, I started my landing check. And then, just as I pulled on the carburetor heat, I realized what had gone wrong. I had forgotten the carburetor heat. The result? Carburetor icing, which had effectively killed my engine and nearly killed me. I had allowed my skills to become so rusty that my reactions were no longer instinctive. My procedures had become sloppy. You can be sure it won't happen again. We were on the final approach. And we had no idea anything was wrong until we passed the end of the runway. When that gear horn sounded, I almost jumped out of my skin. I know exactly how you feel. When I was back in college, there was a certain Romeo I used to know. We were both from the same hometown, but he was a big man on campus and never paid much attention to me. Well, anyway, one day he invited me to go flying with Wait a second. Wait. I know what she's going to say, so let me tell it the way it really happened. Now I know the problem really started during my senior year. I was a big man then, all conference halfback. I really enjoyed being the center of attraction. The next year I was taking postgraduate work in engineering and spending most of my time in the library. It sure didn't take long for the roar of the crowd to fade away and I became just another graduate student. One afternoon, Sally, a girl from my hometown, introduced me to a new transfer student named Lois. It was clear that Lois thought I was just another guy. During the weeks that followed, I tried to line up a date. No. 
No. No. I decided to try once more, but this time with something even Lois couldn't resist. My plan was to invite her to the homecoming game and dance in a very special way. One that would separate me from the rest of those fellows that were beating a path to her door. My idea was to personally drop the invitation right into Lois's lap. Sally came along just for the ride. When we were near Lois's house, I started my plan. My first pass was to see if she was home and to get her attention. I was in luck. She was outside by the pool. On my second pass, I came in more slowly. Just over the house, I dropped the invitation and banked a little more to get a better view. The star warning caught me completely by surprise. Things happen so fast, I don't remember exactly what I did, but I'll never forget those trees. That little incident taught me one thing. Never use an airplane to prop up a deflated ego. That little incident opened Andy's eyes to several things. But it wasn't until we were married for almost two years before I'd fly with him again. Andy, you never told me that before. I always thought you were a careful pilot. Bill, it only took one. How much do you think I can take, Carl? How many nights can I go without sleep? And all I have to do is sit here and think about the bills that aren't paid. There goes Cora Stevens again. That woman never runs out of gas. But Carl did once. Bills, bills, bills. There isn't even money to pay for food. What are you going to do about these things? All you go do is go up flying in that crazy plane up in space or wherever you are. How do I know what you're doing? They had just had one of their routine arguments, and Carl couldn't get away fast enough. Thanks to the argument, he was half an hour late getting to the airport. He was in no mood to do a proper checkout. It was the busiest time of the day. There were several planes ahead waiting to take off, and several more were in the pattern. Mad to start with, this added loss of time only made matters worse. Carl had a lot to do, and the activity kept him busy. So his personal problems were forgotten for the moment. But once the plane was on course, his personal problems came back again. I never heard of anybody who couldn't go out and ask for promotion. You're nothing but a mouse. That's what you are, a squeaking little mouse. A mouse! And you, honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do about you and these bills. Do you know that Margaret Jones's husband pays the bills? And Parsons's husband pays the bills. They never even see them. I'm going to start on fire with these bills, and I'm going to sit you on top of it, and maybe you'll go out and get a promotion then. All you can think about is flying. Well, one of these days, I'm going to go up there with you. You know, you have never asked me to go up in that silly little plane, have you? It took him a while. He didn't know how long to pull himself out of it. It was only then that he noticed what he should have seen before takeoff. Quickly, he switched to the other fuel tank. Now he was in a real fix. But at least he was a pilot again, not a man with wife troubles on his mind.
Buck was riding with Carl that day. Sure, he'll have arguments now and then, but he won't take them into the cockpit with him. Which reminds me of another story. There was a fellow flew in here one day.